Hey everybody, thanks for coming out tonight. This is the World Campus Technology Club and tonight we have one of the nicest people I've ever met online, um, Philip Wiley, and he will be talking about uh, the pen tester blueprint, a guide to becoming a pen tester. So I will pass it to you. Thanks, thanks for the introduction, Ray. Yeah, this, uh, this presentation came out of my first day of semester class uh, lecture because each semester I would kind of go over pen testing for the class and, you know, kind of tell people what, what entails to become a pen tester. Other professors at the college where I worked at were, would ask me to come in and present to their classes. And the first time I presented was at 2018 at B-Sides DFW, our local uh, B-Sides Dallas-Fort Worth conference here in uh, the North Texas area was the first place I gave it at and gave it numerous times since then. But it started out as a class lecture. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I have my CISSP, OSCP, and the SANS Web App Pen Testing Certification. I'm a senior red team lead at an undisclosed global consumer products company. I'm the adjunct professor at Richland College, formerly Dallas College. I'm the founder of the Pwn School Project, which is a a nonprofit meetup geared towards uh, cybersecurity topics. And I've been in IT and security for over 22 years. The past, the past eight plus years I've spent as a pen tester. I was featured in the Tribe of Hackers Red Team book. And I'm the co-author of the soon to be published book, The Pen Tester Blueprint, Starting a Career as an Ethical Hacker. I kind of, after a while, thought, you know, this would make a really good book, you know, because a lot of people are trying to get into pen testing. So uh, the book is based off of this talk, and that should hopefully come out in the fall. And I'm also the co-host of the Uncommon Journey podcast with Chloe Mistoggi and Alyssa Miller. So I had kind of a crazy intro into uh, pen testing, kind of my scenic route. I started out as a, a pro wrestler uh, back in the, the late 80s, and I got married, and I needed a more stable career. So I went to a trade school and learned AutoCAD to be a CAD draftsman. While I was a CAD draftsman, I found out about sysadmin roles, and it looked a lot more interesting than what I was doing. Although I like CAD drafting, I found out I had more of a, a knack for computers. And one day, the company I worked for, uh, we had a person come in to work on one of our servers, and they were billing at $50 an hour, and I knew we billed at $30 an hour, so I figured based on, on that, this person's making $10 an hour more than I am, and what they're doing looks a lot more interesting. So I taught myself how to build computers, took a Nobel Network class back before Windows networking really got popular. Uh, Nobel Network was the popular network operating system. So I went through that course and got my first job doing a server rollout in Windows uh, 95 upgrade. And from there I went into information security, then in AppSec and then uh, pen testing. And actually, during my time as a pro wrestler, I actually wrestled a bear. And so I share this slide each semester to uh, let my students know that only hack if you have permission, even better with written permission, hacking without permission is illegal. And uh, it reminds me of the, this quote I first heard from, from Spider-Man's Uncle Ben. He said, with great power comes great responsibility. Found out later on, this was a Voltaire uh, quote, and then later on, I found out that it was originally someone else, so I'm not really sure who gave the quote, but <laughs> it's a good, a good one to share each semester. So if you're wanting to be a pen tester, there's a lot of good opportunities to learn pen testing and practice without getting in trouble. If you get, you know, in trouble hacking into a system illegally, then that could prevent you getting any kind of security job or IT job. So what is pen testing? Pen testing is assessing security from an adversarial perspective, attempting to exploit vulnerabilities to gain unauthorized access to sensitive data and systems, also known as hacking. And uh, when you assess security from an adversary perspective, you've got a better understanding of the security risk. Uh, exploitable vulnerabilities are higher risk and a higher priority for remediation as well as justification of, of budget. So if you're able to exploit a vulnerability, then it's a bigger risk than a low level vulnerability, which can become a, a risk later on if someone comes out to exploit. 
but a lot of times it takes justification to spend the money to remediate. Sometimes it's not just a software fix. Sometimes it could be, you know, a new hard, hardware firewall, a new web application firewall, something that could be very costly. So be able to justify it through uh, exploitable vulnerabilities is a good way to, to justify that. And also pen testing is a regulatory compliance required for PCI DSS. And this is really where pen testing as a career really started taking off. When I got into pen testing in 2012, uh, there, most pen testers were either contract or consultants. There weren't very many roles as an internal resource. And as PCI became a requirement, the need for pen testing rose even, even higher. Now you see a lot of companies that their pen test team exists because of PCI. Uh, I worked for a bank for a while and we had like 13 people on our team. Capital One has their own pen test team, US Bank, Bank of America, Capital One, uh, Amazon. A lot of different companies have their own pen testers now. And it was just too costly to pay consultants to do all the pen testing. So you, a lot of companies are hiring their own internal pen testers. Even Walmart has a, a big pen test team. So it's, uh, become a, a need and fortunately there's internal jobs which makes it easier to find jobs. It's it's a lot of fun even after over 12 years, every time I get a shell to a system, get root or a domain admin or administrator, it, it's still just as big a thrill as it was when I first started out. And there's a lot of good opportunities in this area. Although it's not a new area, it's growing as I mentioned through PCI and different requirements like that, there's more opportunities. and. Uh, when you're looking for a pen tester job, you know, the more professional term, full term for it is penetration tester. Uh, sometimes you'll see these roles falling under security consultants, analyst, or engineer titles. Another term synonymous with pen testing are ethical hackers. This is one that you more commonly hear and easier to uh, explain to non technical people. It's easier to understand ethical hacking opposed to pen testing, but you also hear it referred to as offensive security adversarial security, and sometimes in threat and vulnerability management programs. Threat and vulnerability management sometimes will encompass just vulnerability scanning, but sometimes the pen test teams will be part of the, the uh, department known as threat and vulnerability management. Pen testing skills in other areas. So there's other areas that pen testing is, uh, the skills are important and are very valuable like SOC analyst, uh, digital forensics, incident response, network security analysts and engineers, purple teams where the defense and offense work together to try to, to uh, tune the systems to detect any kind of malicious activity. And then application security. Uh, application security, if they're doing it right, they're doing pen tests throughout the software development lifecycle. And so understanding the malicious traffic as a SOC analyst, as a digital forensics investigator, are very important skills to have. It'll make your, make your job easier if you understand what malicious traffic looks like. And there's different types of pen testing targets. More commonly, you see networks and applications, but this has gone on to hardware transportation, you know, with the self-driving vehicles. And it's very important that the vehicles are, are uh, secure and can't be hacked. Also, people are targets. If you can have very secure systems, you know, the best firewalls, the best security in place, but if someone can get in your server room, then there's a lot more chance that they can exploit your systems. And then buildings, you know, the buildings need to be secure as well. And different levels of knowledge. So the target you're testing is a pen tester. There'll be, you know, anywhere from limited amount of knowledge, of, as known as a black box pen test or blind pen test up to a white box or crystal pen test, which is the opposite of the spectrum. This is detailed system information, including apps and uh, different documentation. And, you know, the black box more imitates what a, a, a malicious actor would do, whereas a white box you can test more thoroughly. You know, some people that are really purist in the sense of uh, black box and white box will say, you know, an attacker doesn't have credentials, but sometimes there's you know, assume breaches, sometimes there's internal threats. But also it depends on the, the amount of time that you have to test. If you have a lot of time, then a black box pen test, you know, may be the choice. If you have very little time, then you want the pen tester to have as much information as possible to do the test. 
if you have accounts and even source code on a, a web application pen test, then you can more thoroughly pen test that the target. So a lot of this is going to depend on the amount of time you have to test and to more thoroughly test. If you got applications, then, you know, even uh, maybe it's really secure that someone can't, that it's, unless someone has credentials, it's hard to hack into that system. Then you want to make sure that if someone has access to the system, can't elevate their privileges to admin. And there's even information that, that admins don't need access to. They don't need access to credit card information or, uh, you know, credit card information or account information. So you need to test those levels too, to test for any kind of information leakage. And sometimes that requires being authenticated. And then gray box is what you're going to normally run into as a pen tester. Uh, this is like your IP addresses, URLs. So it's a little more information without going too much in depth, but enough information for a pen test to be performed. Uh, the black box pen test can be pretty interesting. I've done one that was a full scope pen test. So we were able to do social engineering, uh, physical pen testing of the facility. And so the only information we had was the physical address. So it was up to us to use the company's name to find different domain names and IP ranges so we could test their networks. So that was pretty interesting. And different types of, there's different processes throughout the pen test and there's different levels of testing. Uh, vulnerability scans, sometimes this is like a, a group within a company and you should have like reoccurring uh, scans on your systems, vulnerability scans, whether it's weekly, every two weeks, or at least once a month. <clears throat> and this is just running vulnerability scans to find out if there's vulnerabilities on the system. So this is where you run through, run your Nexpo scans or your Nessa scans or or open for us to find vulnerabilities. But as listed in the red text up here, this is not a pen test. Sometimes you, it's interesting that some companies, either they're taking advantage of the consumer or they don't understand themselves. So there are companies that have been known to run a vulnerability scan and put it in their report template and sell that as a pen test, which it's not. It can, it's actually part of a pen test, but not a full pen test. The next level up is a vulnerability assessment. And this is still not a pen test, but this is going a step further than the vulnerability scanning. This is vulnerability scanning plus validating the vulnerabilities. Sometimes your vulnerability scanners will find false positives. So you need to validate those findings to make sure they're not false positives. And, and also within vulnerability assessments, it's not always just vulnerability scanning and validation. It's using other tools to validate those vulnerabilities as using other tools to find vulnerabilities. Doing manual testing with other open source tools is a good way to find vulnerabilities that, that the uh, vulnerability scanner might have not detected. I've used command line tools like Nikto before that, you know, Nessus, the Nessus vulnerability scanner couldn't find or some web application vulnerability scanner couldn't find. And then the next level is your pen test. So you've done your vulnerability assessment. Now you're seeing if you can uh, exploit or hack into any of those vulnerabilities that you found during those first phases of the testing. And then you get into your red team or adversarial testing. A lot of times you hear uh, defense and offense referred to as blue team or red team when re red teaming is, is actually more simulating an adversary with a lot of the PCI testing scopes of pen test has become, have become more narrow. So the need for adversarial testing has become more needed. And so this is like uh, where you you know, the, the scope is, is more broad. You're able to test uh, the people through social engineering, testing building security, using phishing campaigns to see if you can actually get in. Because sometimes, you know, the the environment's really secure and it takes someone clicking on a malicious file on malware to get access to the system. So going through a red, red teaming exercise is one of the ways to do that. And this is starting to get, be, starting to get a lot more pop, popular nowadays. And there's specializations. Most people, most of your pen testers fall under the generalist category. And this is testing wireless network through Wi-Fi networks, light web app. And then you have your application uh, pen testers. And usually generalists come from like a sysadmin background or some other IT or security background. And application pen testers either come from a pen testing background where they've had some experience other types of pen testing or 
they come in through a development background, which is a good way. If you have development experience, then you're going to understand programming and how web apps work. So it, then you just have to learn the uh, pen testing skills for that. So there's different types of applications, you know, web app and mobile and cloud are very popular as well as API because APIs you can use through your mobile apps, through some web apps and IOT uh, devices leverage APIs. And then there's some of the older apps, your thick clients, which uh, are still running a lot. Your Microsoft Office, you know, your executable applications, binary type files, those, are, those still need to be tested as well. And then special, some people specialize in social engineering. I've known some pen testers out there that they started out, you know, social engineering, some of them learned other pen testing. And sometimes that's important if you're a social engineer, if you can get into a company to use drop boxes to get access to the network and other technical parts of pen testing, but some people just purely do social engineering. And then a lot of people that do that also do physical testing, testing, building security. And then there's people that specialize in uh, testing vehicles and airplanes through a, a, a transportation specialization. And then peop some people will specialize in red team. And the red teaming is kind of, you know, it, it encompasses some of the physical and social engineering elements. And a lot of people will progress their career from doing pen test into red teaming, you know, as red teaming has become popular, some people that have the pen testing background kind of move into that area. And sometimes they'll do pen testing or red teaming both. And so this is usually more, most of the reason why people like to attend this talk at conferences is they want to learn how to become a pen tester. So to become a pen tester, you, you need the knowledge of the technology. You need to know how, you, how to build it, how to secure it before you can break it. So understanding networking, understanding operating systems from a sysadmin level, because if you get a command line access to Windows or Linux, then you need to understand that operating system to be able to, to go further in your exploitation. And uh, so understanding Windows and Linux, they're the two most popular operating systems you're going to see. Your enterprise environments are going to be mostly Windows. A lot of your internet facing stuff is going to be Linux based. But then also understanding security and applications and hardware, just understanding that technology in general. And then once you have those, those knowledges, that knowledge base in place, then you need to learn how to hack. This is where I started out. I got my first pen testing job. I had worked as a sysadmin. I'd worked in network security and also application security. So I had the technology piece down and understood, understood security. I just didn't know how to hack. So I enrolled in the uh, OSCP course back you know, when I first got into pen testing because I had to gain those hacking skills. So you can learn hacking through classes, conferences, uh, meetings and meetups, you know, through college classes, you know, college classes are offering ethical hacking classes now. Self-study, using home labs, videos, tutorials, blogs and articles, as well as Twitter. There's a lot of good resources on InfoSec Twitter. And you also have to develop the hacker mindset. Even though you learn some different types of hacks, you have to learn how to put those together and the hacker mindset is, is interesting because it's one of the areas of security that requires creativity and analytical thinking. So learning how to put together the different uh, exploits, say like if you have a unrestricted upload on a server, then you know once you have experience with that, you know, okay, I can upload a malicious file on that system that will allow me to get a shell or command line access to that system. So you learn by doing and practicing your labs and and as you educate yourself, you kind of learn to chain together different exploits to go further on a system. Uh, once you've done you know, these hacks a couple of different times, then once you uh, come across this, these different exploits, then you know, okay, uh, I can upload this malicious file. And then you know from there, okay, if I don't have, if the service that runs a web server is running as root or administrator, then I can do a lot more things. If not, then I've got to elevate my privileges so just from practicing in CTFs and educating yourself, you develop this mindset. And so this takes time and repetition and is best developed with hands-on hacking experience. And that could be through your home lab, uh, CTFs or bug bounties. 
So the, the formula for the pen tester blueprint is technology knowledge and security knowledge plus the hacker mindset. You know, having that knowledge and then learning how to break into it. So one of the things, uh, the very first job I had as a pen tester, uh, our manager really didn't emphasize going out taking hacking courses he was telling us to build something you know build a web server you know as you build an apache web server then you learn the directory structure you you understand like some of the default security so if you understand that then it's easier to hack into the system uh, a very good friend of mine and, and uh, a person i was mentoring uh, we had an opening in our team when i was working at the bank and i recommended him because he was he had a sysadmin background and just seeing how him working in security, how he would find security flaws in the system, I knew that they would make a good uh, fit on the team. And just knowing how to, over the years, installing software, administering software and systems made them, you know, gave them a good basis to be a uh, pen tester. And so where, where do you start? So you need to develop a plan you know, figure out what you know, what you need to know and, and do a gap analysis to find those gaps that you need to, to work on to become a pen tester. So if you have no IT experience, someone, which you know you all are in college, so you've, I'm sure you've had uh, courses on operating systems and hardware. So maybe this is not you, maybe you just need to focus on, on the hacking side of things, learn different security skills. If you don't know, understand Linux, learn Linux. It's a very good, uh, attack platform. There's a lot of free tools out there. And if you have InfoSec experience, then, you know, practice CTFs, learn how to hack, do bug bounties, build a home lab. And no matter what level you're on, uh, you should build a home lab. Even experienced pen testers will have home labs. And sometimes this is where we test our proof of concept code, uh, different exploits that we want to use in a production environment. Sometimes you you know, sometimes exploits can break systems. And one of the differences between a pen tester and a malicious actor is we're going in to do perform a test. We don't want to take down systems. Whereas if a, an attacker breaks into a system and they break something, then their only worry is, is they're worried about getting caught. But as a professional, you're not wanting to break systems. So having your home lab, you're able to test out different types of hacks and exploits in the safety of your lab, you don't have to worry about breaking anything. And sometimes an exploit, once you launch it, it can, it can do something to uh, affect the systems or the services on, on a server or TCP IP ports that once it's ran, you can't run it more than once. So learning how to properly perform that exploit is very helpful in your home lab. You know, different exploits come out, then you can test this in your lab before you actually test it in production. And so uh, setting up your home lab, uh, these are just three uh, high level categories. You can be as granular and as advanced or as basic as you want, but the minimalist is kind of the very basic. And this is kind of one of my favorite because it's uh, portable. With the minimalist lab, you know, sometimes you're studying, you get bored, you want to get away from it. So with, with a, you know, your laptop with your home lab set up on it, you can move to different locations in your, your, your campus or your home. You can go to bookstores or, you know, coffee shops and, and study. So that way there's a change of scenery and that kind of helps, helps your study. If you have to travel for work or, or you're going on vacation, then you can still study with your portable lab. Uh, basically, you just have your attack VM or you use your hosting, your host OS as your attack platform. And then you have vulnerable VMs set up on your system. And then your dedicated lab, you have your attack system, and then you have like another system with uh, vulnerable VMs on it that you can attack, or you can get it very advanced. You can have separate servers and PCs and routers and switches. You could use things like uh, Raspberry Pis to install Linux on and build your servers. So you can make this as complicated as you want to. But one of the things to remember when you're trying to learn, you know, a specific skill, if you really need to work on hacking, then you may want to keep it to, to more of a minimal lab because uh, when you have this more advanced lab, things break and then you're spending time troubleshooting. While that's ex important, uh, sometimes it takes away from your studies. I used to, to uh, 
do web design on the side back in the early 2000s. And I hosted uh, my customers' websites on my home web server. And one of the things I'd run into is sometimes I would come home to, to hardware failures and I'd be re rebuilding a server opposed to building websites where I was making my money. So I eventually went to, you know, a web hosting company to host the sites. But one of the things, you know, I learned from that experience is if you're hosting your own hardware, that makes, makes more work for you. So you might want to keep this in mind when you're learning something in a lab. If you get more complex, then, you know, there's more chance of things to break. And on your home lab, you need a attack platform. You need a operating system to hack from. And Linux distributions are very popular and good, good options. Uh, actually, prior to Linux being very popular, Windows was, was widely used, but so many of the hacking tools were built on Linux. And so that's really why it really went to more of the direction of mainly Linux for, for hacking. So Kali Linux and Parrot OS are two very good uh, platforms for, for pen testing. They have all the hacking tools installed, or if they're not, it's in the distribution so it's like up in the, the OS provider's cloud, so you can easily install those without, uh, without too much effort. And then there's also uh, the Pentester framework, which is a, a script from uh, TrustedSec that you can run on Ubuntu that will let you install all the hacking tools. So that way you can more customize your system. And if you're comfortable in an Ubuntu platform, then you can use that. And then on, your, on Windows, Windows 10, it's good to run Commando VM from FireEye. It's a script and it's kind of similar to uh, the Pentester framework, only you inst install hacking tools on Windows. And sometimes there's tools that run on Windows that's better for hacking in a Windows environment. Some of the, the uh, administrative tools are good to have on there. And another good thing about installing with Commando VM, it sets up security on uh, certain directories to prevent your, your hacking tools from being deleted. If you install tools on Windows, then Windows Defender or whatever antivirus you're running will go out and delete those tools. Yeah, I've learned this the hard way through my experience. So uh, Commando VM sets up permissions to where those tools aren't deleted and it, you can safely keep all your payloads and exploits on that system. And uh, it's really good to have Windows and Linux both to hack with. Uh, back when I was consulting, uh, my preferred platform and still is is a Mac OS with like a Kali Linux VM and a Windows VM with Commando VM. Back then, uh, originally this is before Commando VM was out, so I just had Windows 10 with some hacking tools set up on it and, and some of the Windows administrator tools. So it's good to kind of work with both of those because they're both going to be very helpful. It's kind of interesting looking at some of the red team courses now, you know, red teaming relies heavily on a lot of Windows tools because of PowerShell. You know, a lot of the PowerShell tools are very popular and good for exploiting Windows. So it's really good to have that Windows environment. And then you need targets, you need something to hack. So uh, you can go to volhub.com. There's several vulnerable VMs that you can download and install. And a lot of these VMs are retired CTF VMs. You know, the different conferences people will build uh, CTF, CTF systems for, for the uh, people attending the conference to uh, practice hacking against. And so a lot of times these retired VMs find their way onto Vulnhub as long as some other, as well as some other popular VMs out there. Uh, Metasploitable 2 and 3, these are really good ones to start with. Metasploitable 2 runs only on Linux, but Metasploitable 3 you can install on Windows. And the nice thing about the Metasploitable vulnerable VMs is that they have a lot of different vulnerabilities that you can exploit. So you'll find so many vulnerabilities on there you can exploit, it would be the equivalent to, I would say just right offhand, maybe 10 vulnerable systems. Because you know real world systems aren't gonna be that vulnerable, but with Metasploitable, you're able to, you know, have a lot of different targets on one one VM. So it doesn't take up as many resources. You know, the more VMs you have in your system, the more disk space it takes uses and the more memory it's going to use. So this gives you a lot of a lot of targets to attack on one on one VM. 
and there's a lot of good walkthroughs too. So you can look up some of the walkthroughs for the Metasploitable uh, vulnerable VMs and see how different people are exploiting those systems. So it's a good way to learn how to think like an attacker and learn different exploits. And then you have, there's a lot of different vulnerable applications and VMs through OWASP, but WebGoat is one of the popular ones. There's like WebGoat 7X and 8.1 that are out there, as well as G-Shop, a lot of different vulnerable uh, web applications that you can test, uh, put in your test environment to, to practice hacking. And you can create your own, your own vulnerable targets. Uh, ExploitDB is a website that hosts different exploit code, different uh, scripts used to hack systems with and on that site they also link the uh, to the two versions of the vulnerable software that those exploits will run against so you can download uh, those vulnerable versions of the software and kind of build your own lab and then you can use the exploits against that to learn how to exploit exploit certain vulnerabilities and so recommended reading so here's uh, a list of books. The first book over here listed is Penetration Testing, A Hands-On Introduction to Hacking by Georgia Weidman. Uh, the first year I taught ethical hacking, this is the book I used. And this book is a great one because it shows you through uh, steps in the book on how to build your own, your own lab to, uh, you know, to follow along with the book to learn how to do these different types of hacks. And uh, it was recently... Uh, announced that through Pentester Academy, Academy uh, they're building labs based on Georgia's book. So if you have this book, then you can use the labs will be available on Pentester Academy that you can go through and, and, and use it. So that's one of the great things about the book. Georgia's very, very sharp individual. Uh, she teaches like at a university. She's presented at DEF CON and Black Hat, uh, does all sorts of trainings, uh, has created her own framework for doing mobile pen testing. Very sharp person. And when this book came out about a year after I got my OSCP and I was thinking, I wish this book would have came out sooner because, you know, uh, Georgia actually has an OSCP and this book is really geared towards someone trying to prepare for the OSCP. But it's a really good book that takes you from a uh, beginner level and advances as you go through the book. The next book I'd follow up after that is The Hacker's Playbook 2 and 3. Uh, and make sure you start with version 2 because version 3 gets into more red team uh, oriented pen testing. So you don't want to skip out of version 2. And if you're just learning the, the pen testing piece, then you can actually get by with just version 2 of these books. But this, I would basically use these books in that order. And then for web app pen testing, the web application Hacker's Handbook, Discovering, Exploiting Security Flaws, the second edition. Uh, these are written by one of the creators of Burp Suite, which is a web application pen testing tool. And uh, this book used to have online labs, but instead of updating the book, what they have done, uh, one of the authors that works or is one of the owners of Portswigger that creates the Burp Suite tool has put all this learning content online on their web application security academy. So now they have learning content instead of updating the book and they've got online labs. So this is a really great place to learn. It takes you from, from beginner up to advanced pen tester on there. There's a, a so you really you wanna learn web app pen testing. You can start with that site and work from beginning to end and, and really learn how to, to be a web app pen tester. And just some, uh, reference manuals over here, the Red Team Field Manual and the Operator Handbook. Prior to the, the Operator Handbook coming out this past spring, always recommending the, re recommend the Red Team Field Manual. While it's still a good resource, the Operator Handbook is about uh, four times the size. It's available in ebook and a printed format. And it covers all sorts of stuff from like Docker to Cisco to different hacking tools different blue team related uh, command line stuff, different one-liners. It's a really good re reference to have. And some other re learning resources. Uh, this set of resources, you can see kind of a, a gap dividing the top and the bottom. The top resources are all paid resources. The bottom ones are free resources. 
And there's a link on my website too. So if you go to hackermaker.com forward slash learning dash resources, I have these URLs up there as well as the books listed. But the Sands Institute's really great uh, courses there. It's created by some of the best in the industry. Most of these people work in consulting. They, you know, everyone that teaches their classes has some kind of uh, hands-on experience in the subject they're teaching. And uh, they, they created these courses. So it's really great, but it's fa fairly expensive. So a lot of this is typically you're either going to need to have your employer paying for this or you've got an extra $7,200 laying around that you want to blow. Or it's not a waste of money, but it's very expensive. And then you get to the e-learn security and offensive security. Uh, they're not quite as expensive. You know, you can get like courses there from anywhere around $800, $900 up to $1,300 or so. But the one thing I like about e-learn security versus offensive security is it's more beginner friendly. So they e-learn security takes you through the basics and doesn't require a lot of outside resources. You know, the OSCP, you need to be at a certain level of knowledge before you go through this course. So the e-learn security is kind of a good place to start. And even if you ultimately want the OSCP, I would start out with the e-learn e securities courses. Uh, the uh, certifications are starting to become a little more well-known, uh, not quite in demand as much on jobs, which I think that's going to slowly slowly change. It's a really good, really good resource. And with the offensive security certifications, as well as the e-learn security courses, you actually have to perform a pen test to get the certification. And also there's virtual hacking labs. This is a good online lab. This takes you from beginner to advanced and they give you a lot more uh, hints on the lower level VMs on there. So they'll tell you what operating system version and different uh, software is running on there to give you some tips on how to hack that system. And they even have an Android device. And as you get more advanced, more difficult machines, then they give you less, less tips. So basically this is you learn, you're learning the basics and then they kind of take the train wheels off as you get more advanced. And they have like a, online, there's a course involved with it too. So there's course materials before you actually get into the hacking. And then Pentester Academy is a really great resource. They have their attack and defense labs, which I think there's like 1,700 or 1,800 labs online. And they're expanding all the time. They have some red team specific courses on there, stuff related to web app, pen testing, you name it. So it's a really great resource. Uh, I think it's like $69 a month. And there's even like JavaScript geared towards pen testing. Uh, I think there's like a Python course for pen testers. So that's a really good resource. And then you have Pentester Lab. This one is geared more towards web app pen testing. And the thing I like about this one is it's more than just, you know, a web application pen test focused course. They teach you Linux security. They give you different badges as you complete different sections. If there's different vulnerabilities that can be exploited to give you command line access or, you know, full system control, then they'll show you how to do it in certain labs. So they kind of go a little further on some of the web app pen testing than some other courses do. And then practical pen test labs. This is a nice little inexpensive course. It's $64 for lifetime access. You have v VPN access to mainly, I don't think there's any Windows systems in there, but for the price, it's really good. You have VPN access and you go through and you have these different Linux systems to hack into. And then these, the next resources are free. Uh, Bug Crowd and HackerOne offer free resources because they're wanting to recruit uh, web app pen testers on their platforms. And bug bounty hunters get paid based on the bugs they find. So they want you to be successful. So Bug Crowd has Bug Crowd University. They have some video courses on there different learning content and then hacker one has some video content and they have more of a structured course in an online CTF at their hacker one on one.com. So they have, it's online CTF. So you go through and try to perform these different types of uh, attacks against vulnerabilities to find vulnerabilities on these web apps. And then SANS uh, has a really good blog out there. If you go to the SANS pen test blog, they have different cheat sheets and tutorials on how to use different hacking tools. And then hackingtutorials.org from the creators of virtual hacking labs 
they have like different tutorials on how to use Nmap, Metasploit, different hacking techniques. So that's a really good resource. And the Web Security Academy, as we mentioned, that's uh, part of the Web App Pen Test, the Web Application Hackers Handbook. So this uh, this Web Security Academy is a great resource, totally free. And then you have the OWASP website, the Open Web Application Security Project. They have the OWASP testing guide, the OWASP top 10, which a lot of uh, web app pen tests and pen testers use these standards to test against. Uh, there's different vulnerable applications that you can download off there. A lot of good educational content. And also there's Hack the Box. Hack the Box is a really good resource for hands-on hacking along with Try Hack Me. They have these vulnerable VMs that you can try to hack to, to work on your hacking skills. And then there's the over the wire CTF and under the wire CTF. Over the wire is Linux based and this is really good at learning Linux security, not necessarily just hacking. And then under the wire CTF is Windows based and PowerShell. So you can learn different PowerShell uh, enumeration and hacking in, in a Windows environment. So those are some really good re resources. And those are those last ones I mentioned are free. And different certifications. And one of the things I want to say before I start uh, speaking to this slide is if you're gonna get certifications, make sure to learn the content because there's some certifications like the CEH and Pentest Plus that is our question and answer based certifications. So you're just answering, you know, you just have to know the questions the day of the exam. But if you remember this, this content, when you're going through interviews, this is helpful information to have. And, you know, if you get a job as a pen tester, you don't wanna go back and relearn some of this content you went through. So as you're going through this, learn, the content. There's going to be times that, you know, I think of someone that I talked to in the local community that had become a pen tester. They worked as uh, a reverse engineer and they took assembly language in college and the, it didn't really require you to be able to program an assembly, but they just learned enough to pass the class. And then once he got out in the field, then he had to go back and learn assembly to do, you know, to write exploits. So as you're going along, keep this in mind, this, you know, if you're going through school for security, this is stuff you're going to use in the field. Make sure you learn. If it's art appreciation, if you don't remember that, or music appreciation, or some something like that, not relevant to your field, then I wouldn't worry about it. But if it's something you may need to use down the road, make sure to learn it. You know, you don't want to just be a piece of paper. You want to prove that you know you spent the time to get this credential. You want it to to amount to something. So your entry level certifications are gonna be your CEH and your Pentest Plus. Uh, the EC Council Cert, uh, the CEH is one of the oldest ones, one of the oldest ethical hacking or pen testing certifications out there. It's one of the DOD recognized certs. The DOD has a list of certs for security. CISSP is one of them. There's some other uh, CompTIA certs on that list, is, and, but the Pentest Plus not on there yet. So a lot of companies that are either doing business with the government or people that work for the government, a lot of times they like to see these DOD certs and the CEH is one of those. It's really well known in HR. A lot of recruiters know it. So a lot of times it's one of these things that's gonna help you get your foot in the door. That's what these entry level, entry level certs are gonna do. Before you have the experience and get a job in the field, you're gonna need experience. And so when you're starting out, certifications are going to be more important. As you get the experience, they're going to be less important. Then you have your intermediate certifications, and these are the ones that, that if you look for pen testing jobs, these are the ones that people are going to look at. They're going to say one or more of the following, and you have your SANS G-PIN, which is their pen test cert, and the SANS web application pen testing cert. Uh, and these are, are question and answer based exams, although they're really you know, they prove that you know the content because they'll have like a picture of output from a certain pit hacking tool or pen testing tool. And you're supposed to be able to describe what you see in that or how to use certain tools. But like the offensive security courses, you have to actually go through and do a pen test. So you have to hack like uh, four out of the five systems to get like a total of 75 points to pass those exams. But as far as pen test jobs go, you see the SANS and offensive security pretty much respected equally. Uh, but these intermediate certifications, these are the ones if someone sees on your resume, then they'll contact you to try to recruit you for pen test jobs. 
and then your advanced certifications, uh, the SANS uh, Advanced Pen Testing and Exploit Development Cert, the GXPN, and the OSCE from Offensive Security are pretty similar certifications. Currently, the SANS Cert is dealing with more current technologies. OSC is a little, OSCE is a little more outdated, but it's uh, a very tough exam to pass. And if you have that certification, it goes a long way with, with getting a job. So the intermediate to advanced uh, certifications, if you have those, those are the ones that they're looking for most of the time. So let's get your foot in the door. And like I said, once you get the experience, then the certifications aren't gonna matter as much. If it's a consulting company, then it is gonna matter because they're trying to show how good their consultants are. And so certifications are a way to display that. And just different, dot, here's some job tips that I like to share. And this is stuff that I've shared with my students. Uh, so far in the two and a half years I've been teaching, I've had five of my students get pen testing jobs. So uh, just kind of some of the tips I like to share. Uh, professional networking, you know, your different clubs, like in your, your school, uh, different meetup groups, conferences, network. Get out there and, and meet people. It's not good enough just to show up. Get out there and, and talk to people that attend these meetups. Uh, me teaching ethical hacking, I have people come to me all the time looking for junior pen testers. And so if I know someone in the community that has the skills or wanting to get into that type of career, then I'll refer to them. So, and that's the same across the, you know, with other people. Uh, my last three pen testing jobs were from people I knew in the community that referred me. And my last job I was, was actually someone I knew from Dallas Hackers Association. And they actually, you know, went through my class. They needed a red team lead. And so he actively tried to, he recruited me. And so just knowing people, you know, it's a lot easier to, to get jobs. I mean, the jobs will, will find you after a while. And LinkedIn, I mean, make sure to keep your LinkedIn profile professional, it's your online resume. These keywords, when recruiters are looking for you, they're going to find your LinkedIn profile. So make sure you put everything on there that you have experience with. You know, be accurate with your resume as well as your LinkedIn. Don't put stuff on your resume that you don't know how to do or you have very little experience. Or put on your resume that, you know, let someone, let the interviewer know you took a class on this. You have, you know, the amount of experience. Because when a, an interviewer is looking at your resume, they're basing the interview off your resume. They don't know you, they've got your resume. If you said you use Metasploit, they're gonna ask you questions about Metasploit. If you put Burp Tweet on your resume, they're gonna ask you questions about the different items on your resume that are pertinent to that job. These are prerequisites for the job. They're gonna know how well you know those. So you're kind of dictating your, uh, your interview. So if, if you have all these tools on there and maybe you've opened Burp Suite once, but you don't know how to use it, they're going to ask you questions. And so you're not going to do too well in that. So, you know, just let them know how much experience you have. And if you, they're asking you for a certain tool that you've used and you don't have experience with it, just let them know your experience with it, you know, that you've used it in a lab environment. You've taken a class, you've done tutorials and just kind of explain it. So a really cool tip I saw earlier this year was where someone had wrote out on the resume, they were trying to get a job in security and they went and they put some of the different softwares that they took classes on and just kind of basically labeled it, you know, that through education, that it really wasn't from hands-on experience. So that's a way to let the interviewer know you have ex some exposure to it, but then you're not overstating it. You don't want to misrepresent yourself. And then prepare for your interview. The more prepared you are for the interview, the better you'll do. And that's still me to this day. If I prepare for an interview, I'm going to do better because there's some things you haven't touched in a while you need to brush up on. Uh, know the OWASP top 10, no matter what kind of pen test job you're going for, uh, interviewers are always going to ask questions about the OWASP top 10. These are very uh, common vulnerabilities. And so they're going to ask the different types of cross-site scripting and how to remediate those. So, you know, get familiar and know the OWASP top 10 that'll go a long way on your technical interviews and be able to explain the basics like the three-way three -way TCP handshake as well as the OSI model. Because some of your more senior managers, someone that's been away from the technology side for a while, they're going to, some of the things that they'll remember are the basics and that's what they're going to ask you. They may not be up to date with all the latest pen testing uh, tools and stuff, but these are the things that they'll remember. So 
you don't want to go in and blow an interview over something that's kind of, you know, basic. So make sure to prepare for your interview. And uh, here is my contact information. And uh, feel free to reach out, reach out to me on LinkedIn, uh, email, or Twitter. And there's my website. I have some information on there, like the resources. I run uh, two monthly meetups, and they're all virtual now. They were started out physical and then physical and streaming. But with COVID, we've been 100% stream. But we have two of those each month. And on the Pwn School website, you can find links to our meetup page for the meetings so that way you can see the information about who's presenting as well as on the site, there's recordings on YouTube of some of the talks on there. So there's some really good past talks that we have on there. And so my ethical hacking classes are starting up pretty soon at Dallas College and I teach web app pen testing. And also you get a chance to check out the Uncommon Journey podcast on ITSPM Magazine. Uh, we talked to a lot of people that are well known in the industry of how they got started and people got some interesting stories. I mean, a lot of times this is kind of encouraging, you know, someone says, hey, that's kind of how I got started. And so really inspiring and, and good stories. And feel for, you know, the way I got into teaching and presenting at conferences and stuff was through mentoring, just talking to people online. That's kind of how Ray and I got connected through, you know, online, you know, we've communicated and and so I like to share resources with people and this is how I got into teaching. So if you ever have questions after this, feel free to reach out to me. But now I'm gonna open it up for questions. Hi, Philip, this is Maria. Um, first Hi. of all, thank you for, um, for sharing with us your expertise. I have a quick question regarding the attack plat um, platform Home Lab that you just mentioned. I know you provided four types of Home Lab. Um, for, for beginners, would you, if you can have to suggest either of Kali Linux or Parrot, which one would be the best um, for the beginners? They're, they're both nice because you can easily install um, <clears throat> install the hacking tools. I would say currently, if you would ask me a year ago, I would have said to use Kali Linux, but recently due to some of the updates to Kali Linux, and also part of this too is some of the tools are going to Python 3. There's some compatibility problems with, uh, with, with Kali Linux. So some of the basic tools will run fine. I was doing a wireless or Wi-Fi pen test for my employer recently. And on my attack laptop, I had Kali Linux set up and the wireless, the Wi-Fi network adapter that I was using would not work. I couldn't get the drivers to work. And so I switched over to Parrot OS and Parrot OS was nice because I went to their website and I was able to find instructions. Actually, this was beyond the, the uh, Wi-Fi adapter I was trying to run a hash cracking software and they use GPUs, your graphics processor. And on Kali Linux, some of the different uh, blogs out there said, yeah, I use Windows to, for Hashcat because it's hard to find drivers to work on Kali Linux. So I found detailed instructions on, on Parrot OS's website on how to install the drivers. So uh, there's a lot of similarities, but right now currently I would say that, that uh, Parrot OS is a little more stable and it's, it's a very secure OS for doing, you know, your day-to-day -day, uh, computer use. Uh, in previous years, Kali Linux used to use root and you would run as root. It wasn't as secure minded. It wasn't meant to be a secure platform. It was meant for testing, but they have gotten more secure with it. But Parrot OS has a lot of, takes in consideration a lot of privacy. So they have privacy plugs in, plugins for, for Firefox. So when you're surfing, it kind of protects your identity and it's a good day-to-day -day use Linux. So I would say Parrot OS. I used, I used to, was a huge Kali Linux fan and not as big anymore. I mean, just some of the newer changes and compatibility issues, but I would say Parrot OS. And once you get used to Parrot OS, if you need to go back and, and use Kali Linux, there's not going to be a lot of difference there. But So that's my recommendation, kind of a long-winded response, but I hope that answered your question. It did. Thank you. Are oh, you welcome? So yeah, someone asked if I could share these slides. Yeah, I can send a, a PDF of these slides after.
Yeah, on the Uncommon Journey podcast I do, they'll they'll announce that when Melissa announces, she'll say that a uh, a bear wrestler, a uh, pre med student in the humanitarian work, and in, walk into a, a nightclub. Also, the uh, I did a interview with uh, Sec Juice, and it was called it was like their Uncommon Journeys, and it had a story related to I mentioned my wrestling and bear wrestling in it. So yeah, seeing the mention of hack the box, yeah, hack the box. That's really a good place to work on your work on your hacking. And there's uh, some some clubs. It's interesting too because hack the box. They've started some local meetups in different areas. So like in the Dallas area, at least once a month they get together and do like a, a CTF on hack the box. And usually with the hack the box CTFs, they take people from beginner level. So there's some education portion of the meeting. And then, you know, as you get experience, you just come in and start working on the CTF, but they have like a beginner section. So they'll take people through and, and show them how to use different pen testing tools and techniques. Anybody else have any questions? And if you can't think of anything now, feel free to reach out to me. Like I said, I'm always happy to answer someone's questions. I would definitely recommend reaching out to Philip if you have any questions. Um, he's a good resource. Also Poe School. I know there's a lot of um, people there that can answer questions too. Yeah, it's um, the, our Pwn School Slack's a good place because we have a lot of people from, you know, the defense backgrounds, SOC backgrounds. That's another, we have a really good talk on the Pwn School website or the YouTube page. Someone that did a talk on uh, becoming a SOC analyst. A lot of people don't think about that, but that's a really good way to enter the field of cybersecurity. So there's a lot of different good talks on there. But, and also to connect with me on LinkedIn. If you're looking for a job and you need someone to, you know, draw attention to your posts on uh, getting a job in security, a lot of times I'll do posts for people or I'll share your post if you're looking for a job. So, you know, take advantage of your network, you know, get out there and network and let other people help you, you know, some let their following, you know, benefit you. Nick asked what you're using for your home lab. Uh, for my home lab, I've actually got a, a, a home built uh, PC that I built. It's, uh, I'm trying to remember what processor it, it's one of the, uh, the small form factor, the ITX case, I believe, but it's uh, right below the, right before the i9 processor came out, it's 32 gigs of RAM, uh, one terabyte of uh, solid state drive. And I'm running Ubuntu as the host OS. And I've got like several vulnerable VMs on there. I've got Metasploitable 2 and 3, as well as some other CTF VMs that I downloaded. And so when I built my server, I wanted something lightweight and quiet. Uh, used to, I liked having servers, but then, you know, servers, you know, regular big servers uh, heat up the room too much and they're noisy. So I wanted something kind of quiet. So that's one of the reasons I like the solid state drives and some of the smaller form factor computers. But as far as like my personal uh, preference on laptops to use, I, I like Macs. So I have a MacBook Pro that also run a home lab. So anytime I'm doing any kind of courses, I'm currently going through Zero Point Security's Red Team course and they have VPN accessible labs. And so the two VMs that you need for the course are a Windows 10 VM and a Kali Linux VM. So those are the VMs that I'm using for that. So I use my, my laptop for a lot of courses. When I go to SANS courses, then the, I use my Mac. Now I really don't mess around with the virtual networking devices, but you can, that's kind of good. You see some of the, I've seen some labs set up for Pentest Plus where they'll take like PF Sense and set up a firewall. So that stuff's kind of good because that kind of gives you another 
another target. If you wanted, you could simulate an external pen test that way. So you can put your your targets behind that PFSense firewall. And you can use stuff like, um, I'm trying to think of, uh, can't think of it at the moment, but there's a really good tool out there. A couple of them, Cisco has one and it's a way to build a virtual network. And uh, there's another one, it's open source. I think they're both free, but you can build like router VMs and you can also set up like server VMs and emulate a full server. And it's kind of cool because you can actually start up all your systems at once. So you can power down your whole network and power it up so you can have like individual systems, but you can get as complex as you want. But I'd say with, with hacking systems, you'll kind of want to start out without firewalls on, you know, if you got your vulnerable VMs, there's some ports that you'll want shut down and some you'll want open. And then as you progress and get more experience, you can enable antivirus on those different VMs. Once you get the techniques down, you want to make sure they're working and then you can enable different la layers of security. But some people will set up PFSense firewalls in the lab I have for my, my course at uh, Dallas College. We have labs based on Georgia Weedman's book, and we actually have like a PFSense firewall and another set of VMs behind that firewall. So yeah, you can use like virtual network devices on there, or you can actually use uh, yeah hard actual hardware devices. All right, uh, I think we're over time. So oh wait, there's another one. Okay. Uh, oh no, that's not a question. Yeah, that's possible. Uh, Look for anyone that's looking to unload software, that uh, hardware, that find other people that, you know, someone that has been working on their Cisco certs. Some people will build CCNA labs or CCMP labs. And then sometimes people just, you know, they don't want all the clutter and they'll get rid of the stuff pretty cheap. So, you know, always keep your eye out on that. Fantastic. Well, this has been great. I am so glad we got to schedule you for tonight. Um, I know this is a topic that everybody always has a lot of questions about, so I think your video will get a lot of playback. Um, I, so I really appreciate you, you coming welcome. out and joining us. And just one, one comment I want to leave you all with, but, you know, pen testing and hacking can be fun, but a lot of these other areas of security can be fun. It's one of the things that kind of makes me kind of sad that uh, you know, there's a lot of people that are too focused on wanting to be an ethical hacker, but there's, I mean, threat hunters out there, people that are looking on their network for, you know, people that are on their network, incident response, you know, looking for hackers, profile hackers like our threat hunters. I mean, they do some pretty cool work. I mean, they're out there. They, someone that was trying to hack into our systems, our network, they were able to figure out what country they were in mapped it to whatever APT on the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So there's a lot of cool stuff out there you can do. You don't have, I mean, not to discourage you if you want to be a pen tester, but look at all your options out there. There's a lot of cool stuff out there. I mean, and there's, there's fun to be had in all areas of security, not just, not just pen testing. I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Um, I will post the video as soon as I, it's done processing. Thank you. Thanks everyone. And thanks, Philip. Thanks. Have a good evening. Good night. <laughs>